Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today as we explore the book, Her Name Was Margaret, Life and Death on the Streets by Denise Davy. Denise Davy is a nationally recognized award-winning journalist who specializes in writing about mental health, homelessness, and gender issues. She was twice honored with the Journalist of the Year Award by the Ontario Newspaper Association and is a recipient of a National Newspaper Award, several Ontario Newspaper Association Awards, and two awards from the Registered Nurses Association of Ontario. Penny Nut Brown is our host today. Penny is a retired teacher who now spends her time tutoring, volunteering, and attending a program in lay ministry. Penny is also currently the children's minister at St. John Anglican Church in Port Hope. Welcome Penny and Denise. Denise has provided us with a short, compelling video about Margaret. So I thought that before we get started with our interview, our audience might like to take a look at this. Margaret Jacobson was born April 5, 1944, first child of Abe and Verna Jacobson, who were Pentecostal missionaries in Barbados. As a child, Margaret loved nothing more than drawing with her pastels, listening to the radio with her brothers, writing in her diaries, playing the accordion and piano in church, and going to the beach. How did this child with such promise become one of Hamilton's longest surviving homeless women? How did she go from top student and Sunday school teacher to a destitute woman who slept in the alleyways and alcoves of this city? These are some of the questions I set out to answer when I wrote my book. Her name was Margaret, life and death on the streets. Welcome, Denise. Um, I, it's you. funny, I, this is the first time we've met and yet I feel that I know you. <laughs> Uh, quite well. Um, I would like to thank you for writing this amazing book. Um, so often in our culture, we don't take the time to acknowledge the humanity of the people that we pass on the street or to deal with issues such as poverty and homelessness and mental health yeah. issues. So thank you very much for the book. And I really felt that your voice came out um, in this book, as did Margaret's. So I was wondering if you could begin perhaps by telling us a little bit about your background in what, like you were working as a reporter for the Hamilton Spectator at the time, I believe, and okay. writing about social issues in particular. So okay. I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about your background up to that moment where you met Margaret. Absolutely. Thank you, Penny, and thanks for having me. And, and thanks for your kind comments. I'm glad Margaret's voice did come through in the book. Um, so yes, you're right. I, I've been a um, reporter at the Hamilton Spectator for about nine years at that point. And as I say in the book, I had been um, writing uh, from the comfort of my newsroom desk, uh, writing about homelessness, but really about just the statistics and reports that were coming out. And I felt like it was pretty dry stuff. So I needed to put a face to the issue and uh, basically ask my editor if I could spend the night at the Wesley Center which was known for its more uh, sort of chronically homeless. And they're the people that are more uh, involved in, um, who have mental illnesses and addiction and um, really are the, like the longest standing uh, homeless people. So um, went down there on a cold winter night in, uh, it was a Sunday and um, got there about 11 PM, which is when it opened. Uh, Cause it was a, considered an emergency shelter. There were just, like I said, rickety wooden benches, no no beds to lay on or anything. It was pretty uncomfortable, but the chronically homeless liked the fact that they could come and go when they please, and there was a, uh, no curfew. 
so I got there about 11 p.m. I interviewed a couple of people and I looked across the room and there was this tragic figure. Um, and this picture was actually taken from that first night I met her, um, sitting by herself in a bench, really sort of centered in the middle of the room. And I, I was just in shock. I mean, I still get goosebumps when I think about that moment because uh, she was so worn down. Like I said in the book, she looked like an inmate from a Victorian workhouse. Um, it was absolutely uh, um, unbelievable how just tragic she looked. And I asked uh, a staffer who it was and they said, oh, that's Margaret. Um, she'd been coming here for almost 10 years. Uh, she's probably been diagnosed with schizophrenia because she's very erratic. She can be violent. Uh, she's known for hitting people across the face with their, their melamine, hard melamine mm -hmm. coffee cups um, and, and pretty much warned me not to talk to her because uh, she could be violent. And I thought, uh, number one, I have to know this woman's story. I mean, just every gene in my body that was a journalist and also just as a, as a person, I had to know how she had come to this horrible state uh, in a country like Canada that's known for its social safety net and uh, we're supposed to be so compassionate to uh, our most vulnerable people. Um, and I also felt like if she was, had been violent and hitting people, it was probably in self-defense. Uh, and that if I was kind to her and, and uh, that she wouldn't, she wouldn't hurt me. So I did go over and um, talk to her and uh, surprisingly, she opened up. So we, we had the, the privilege of seeing some photographs at the beginning of this piece of uh, Margaret Jacobson um, in her early life. Yeah. Um, I was wondering if you could tell us a bit about her as well. Yes. So what, what happened in her life up to that moment when you two met? Exactly. Yeah, that, that was the big, big question. Um, so uh, the one thing I did is that she opened up and told me she'd been uh, born and raised in Barbados, that her parents were actually Canadian Pentecostal missionaries and, and had moved there for their work. Um, she was the oldest of uh, four children. She had three younger brothers. Uh, it kept to a very rigid schedule of Sunday school classes. Uh, and she had learned to play the piano and accordion um, in Sunday school. Um, very uh, rigid, like I said, very religious family. Uh, and then she was very proud of the fact that she'd uh, worked as a typist at some point. Um, now the staffer had mentioned that she had been hospitalized for quite a while. Um, and so I asked her about that and that's when she really shut down. Whenever I talked about the hospital, she'd shut down. She'd so she had this line that she would use that said, my nerves were too bad. Um, you know, I didn't, there was something, I couldn't manage such and such because my nerves were too bad. Um, a very simplistic way of talking about her very complex form of schizophrenia that she had. But uh, uh, after she told me that, I left that night later on. Um, and by the way, she stood up waving her arms like this at the end of the night when I was about four hours later when I was leaving. And I thought, how, I don't even know how she was standing, but uh, she was just saying goodbye to me. But so I was able to get her to sign a freedom of information form, um, which the hospital said if she did that, they would allow me to access her files. And I'll just show you what those files looked like because uh, they were hefty. Um, so they allowed me to go in and actually read them and uh, take notes and photocopy maybe about 20 uh, copies of uh, pages. Uh, and that was later when I met a family member that they actually gave me those files that I just showed you. Um, and that's when my book completely turned on its head because I went from the stories that she told me and, and staff had told me um, to really a deep dive, in-depth look at exactly what happened to this woman during this horrible period of deinstitutionalization. Okay, so um, that brings us to the topic of deinstitutionalization. And uh, I'm, I'm familiar with it uh, to a certain extent. Um, I grew up in the Eastern Townships of Quebec and the area I lived in had a number of facilities for people with mental health challenges, as well as those with developmental dele uh, development issues. And um, they were shut down in the 70s and 80s. And I, I saw the repercussions of that in the community I grew up in. Um, but could you explain to us a bit what it what deinstitutionalization was, yeah. um, what it was supposed to be, and and how it failed? That's an excellent question. Well, well worded too. 
Um, so it, it all became possible, and this was a good thing uh, because of the introduction of these psychopharmaceutical drugs and the clorazepam type of thing was one of the biggies. And for the first time in the history of civilization, they found something that could actually manage or control the symptoms of complex mental illnesses like schizophrenia. And um, so, I mean, horrific side effects. It's not to say uh, that they were perfect, but uh, they did manage to control them. And so Margaret went into the hospital uh, in the 60s, and it was around this time that they were saying, well, listen, now that we can manage these drugs, let's let these people live in the community where they can be productive citizens, lead more rewarding lives. Maybe some of them could, could even actually hold down jobs, this sort of thing. So the, the move was on to close the beds and move people out. And it was supposed to be a two-part plan, close the beds and then set up community supports. And that was mental health clinics in the neighborhoods where people were relocated. Uh, and in Hamilton's case, that was very much inner city. Um, hire outreach workers, nurses, social workers to visit them all on a very regular basis um, and uh, just have the hospital beds available to them when and if needed. So the problem was part two never materialized in, in any way, fashion or form. And, and people going to use mental health services today will still tell you that. I mean, it's all these years, 60 years later. And we're still, in effect, paying for the sins of our fathers because it's still an absolute uh, appalling situation. So for Margaret and thousands of, of uh, because by the time they, they stopped 20, 30 years later, 80% of psychiatric hospital beds across Canada had been closed. And that enabled them to, move, to close entire hospitals like the Lakeshore Hospital in, in Toronto, which was uh, huge. And the Hamilton Psychiatric Hospital in, in Hamilton. And some were replaced. There were more psychiatric beds put into uh, general hospitals, um, but nowhere near the number. And not to say that the hospitals were the perfect place. I mean, they were. They could be oppressive environments. Margaret wasn't completely happy at where she was because she was in there for 24 years on and off. Uh, not to say they were perfect, but she had three meals a day and shelter and safety. Uh, certainly she wasn't, you know, laying in a sleeping urine soaked sleeping bag on, on a, a park lawn or a, in laundromats or park benches and that sort of thing. So, um, so the beginning of that sounded good on paper, uh, saved the government. I can't even know because nobody's really looked at it, but saved billions of dollars because the biggest cost in healthcare are the bricks and mortar of the hospitals itself. And, um, and literally nothing has been set up. So, I mean, I'm still writing stories about people who uh, look for help. And I notice every time I do give a talk, um, I hear from somebody who has a son or daughter or spouse or sister, uh, and they're, they're lost in the system as, as Margaret was. Now, you make a point um, in your book about how, when you said like this was, this was going to save a lot of money. Yeah. But I also make a point in the book that the deinstitutionalization without the community supports actually has cost the state a great deal of money. Could you explain a little bit about how this attempt to, you know, um, provide a better life for people on one side, but also save money on the other has kind of not done either. So I was wondering if you could talk about the financial side of Absolutely. this as well. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and I'll just mention, too, that an interesting uh, uh, research paper I read said that uh, movies like uh, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest mm -hmm. had, a, had a huge impact in helping pave the way mm -hmm. for deinstitutionalization because they really fed into the, the whole anti-psychiatry movement that was going on at the time. And because you so watch that movie and you're like, oh, my God, what a horrific environment and forced lobotomies and uh, everything else, which which was happening in some hospitals. However, uh, it's like the going from the fire to the frying pan. So um, in terms of cost, again, it's such a good question because I, I was just talking to somebody on city council and um, they were shocked when I told them about the copious studies that show it costs between 85 and $120,000 a year to keep someone homeless. So we are paying that in, here's one statistic that uh, homeless people use uh, emergency wards uh, eight to nine times more than the general population because they, they go in when they're really, really sick. They may have uh, broken a bone or something, uh, but they don't go until they're really in the, in the end stages of an illness. They require intensive help. 
Uh, and then they have no place to recuperate because they can't keep them. They have these short stay policies still. So they can't keep them uh, for even overnight. Um, so they have nowhere to recover. They forget to take their medication. They can't change the gauze on their wound. Um, a whole series of events takes place. And so that they, they, they eat up uh, police time on the street because police, there was an officer in Hamilton who drove around for four hours with a homeless person in the back seat because nowhere to go. And then at six in the morning, bought him a coffee and let him out. That's police hours. Detox centers, the jails, the jails are full of mental illness. They call them the, you know, the criminalizing uh, the mentally ill. Um, and so we have paid in so many ways. And I, like I said, so many times I get emails or, or people come up to me after a talk and will say, you know, that they're, they know somebody who's been impacted by this. And so we're all impacted. Mm -hmm. um, so yes, the cost, there's an excellent study by, I think it was Dr. Eric Latimer at McGill. And he really did a deep dive in the major cities across Canada and looked at um, like 18 months of um, individual studies on people. Uh, again, showing that uh, it's by far costing us more to keep people homeless. Now, um, I understand that at least in Margaret's time that there was an effort to place them in boarding homes mm -hmm. in communities. Um, I was wondering, but those places were not the humane refuges that might one might have thought. Could you talk a little bit about those boarding homes, please? Because that that, that that's, that's an issue that actually still exists today. So back then, they were yeah, they were just called boarding homes. Uh, they were run by people who had zero experience working with anyone with a mental illness. They were basically just business people. Um, I, I know in one case, a, a social worker I met who who knew Margaret at the hospital. Uh, she tried to talk to an operator about giving Margaret the medication and he and he just yelled at her and said, I'm not a psychiatrist. I'm not getting into that kind of stuff. So yeah, in Hamilton, there's a lot of inner city uh, two and a half story brick homes, a lot of them, a row after row in a lot of different neighborhoods. And this is where um, these rundown boarding homes would be. Um, one of them, according to a social worker, uh, he just cleared out the living room and put like eight single cots beside each other. So people were sandwiched be beside each other like this. He hired a teenage girl to make their meals, which meant uh, cold cereal and water in the morning, and then shuffle them out at nine o'clock, lock the door. Uh, maybe they give them a peanut butter sandwich and a bag and let them back in at five o'clock. I mean, and these are people like Margaret who, like I said, needed medication, needed supports. Uh, she actually had employment programs at the hospital where she learned typing and, and um, pottery and things like that. Um, so after, um, and I can't remember the exact year, but there was a city councilor named David Christofferson who went on to be an MP. And uh, he was actually going through something with his father in one of these homes and it prompted him to um, get into uh, actually getting standards and regulations and rules in these places so that the hygiene and sanitation and safety issues were looked at. And so that was the first attempt in the entire province to regulate these homes. And um, however, a lot of the complaints were um, complaint driven. So you had to actually have somebody in the home phone the city and say, you know, we're eating moldy bread. Well, you're talking about people who have a mental illness or who are quite elderly, uh, who first off don't even know that they're supposed to be calling. And secondly, if they, they did, they don't want to risk losing their, their entire shelter. So um, they went through a different, they were called second level lodging homes and now they're back to called uh, residential care facilities. And in the city of Hamilton, they are still shutting them down. Um, for, like I said, hygiene and safety reasons. They're still going in. You hear about it um, all the time. So there's, there's still a problem. They're, they're basically places to just throw, throw away people. And it's very tragic. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about um, some of the challenges that people with mental illness face when they are on the streets. And one point in your book really, really struck me was the point that you make that when you met Margaret, she was 49 years old. Mm. And at that time she was described by the people at the Wesley Center as being one of the oldest homeless women. Mm -hmm. And so I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how the challenges of life on the street um, affect, well, 
first of all, people with mental illness, but also in particular women. Mm. How is the life of a woman on the street different from mm. perhaps that of a man on the street? Wow. Yeah, another good question. Um, so I think that's actually, aside from the biggest question I get asked, which is, um, it, this is a choice, isn't this a choice for people, uh, which uh, drives me crazy. Um, aside from that, to me, this is probably the second largest myth, um, is that uh, people are uh, camping, um, enjoying the freedom of being without a home. I, I know. Um, and in reality, and this was something I was not aware of before I really started to, uh, research for the book was that the level of health problems that they suffer from is absolutely huge. I mean, there's basically no one who doesn't have health problems and they're everything, epilepsy, diabetes, stage four cancer, uh, just a very complex uh, lung diseases. Um, and also in, in the summer, they suffer from sunstroke in the winter frostbite. Uh, one fellow I interviewed, Casper, who's in the book, ended up with gangrene because he was basically like no shoes in the middle of winter. Um, it's basically everybody. And uh, rates of anxiety and depression among homeless people are sky high. They're absolutely and, and completely understandable. And one of the studies I found said that, you know, if they end up on these streets because of uh, poverty and, and here's a, a sad thing that's happening more and more because of rent evictions, mm -hmm. um, if that happens to them, um, then the, the chance of developing anxiety, depression are very, very high. And again, it's completely understandable. I mean, you just, the, the, the sort of misery that they, that they live in. I mean, I look at the tent encampments in Hamilton. And they're just pouring rain and it's cold and there's a humiliation that they deal with from people coming around and yelling at them. And uh, I mean, no washroom facilities. Mm -hmm. uh, so as, as women, basically all of those are uh, quadrupled, especially the issue of violence. Uh, there's like, you look at uh, places that are co-ed, um, like out of the cold and, and they're way, they're way, they're dominated by, by men. And for some reason, I know in Hamilton, I think this is across the province, that we haven't applied the gender lens to the homelessness mm -hmm. issue and looked at just how bad it is because there's actually ample shelter beds for men in Hamilton. But the number of beds for women are a fraction of the number. And uh, so way more of them are either living on the streets or engaging as Margaret did in, in the survival sex to just get off the streets for, for one night or two nights sort of thing. But the um, one place that uh, is the biggest place in Hamilton is called Mary's Place. And I think it was uh, two years ago, their turnaway rate for, for tw I think it must have been 2019, was something like 2,840 or something. And that was the number of times they had had to turn away a woman because they had no beds. So it's a 25 bed shelter. They have a chair that they'll put somebody in. They have a couch. There's a, so when it's packed to the roof and there's no way they can put anybody else in, that's still how many times they had to turn somebody away. So yeah, they deal with a lot more, you know, and I, I talk about the issue of, um, you know, when they're menstruating and the sort of what Margaret did was just like, because she was just almost like feral at that point was just not use anything. And it was just a mess everywhere. And uh, so there's a lot of different things like that, that women have to be, but mostly like the issue of violence. Very scary. You just touched upon, um, you know, the blame game, right? Like mm -hmm. I've heard, um, you know, people say, oh, well, you know, they like it on the street. Mm -hmm. They don't want to live by rules. Um, you know, yeah, that's a good one. Have rules, or they're all drunks or they're all drug addicts. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, you know, I think you touched on it, but is, is life on the streets really a personal choice that anyone makes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, I'm so glad you mentioned that, Penny, because that just, I, I will often say, people say, oh, what's your book about? And I'll, you know, I'll try to do a sort of, uh, you know, 30 second description sort of thing. And, and then I see this look on their face and going, yeah, that's really sad what some people go through, but you know, a lot of them are there by choice and you're just like, who would choose that? Who would choose that miserable, horrible lifestyle that uh, they are there as an act of desperation and they're, they're there because they've run out of choices. I mean, and it's completely rational that they have turned their backs on shelters. Uh, the COVID rate among uh, shelter residents is way higher than the average general population. 
Um, I mean, it was already scary because they're bed bugs. Uh, there are outbreaks and all sorts of, uh, you know, the, even the flu or something can, can run through them quickly because their beds are so close together. Um, and, you know, there's just the issue of, like I said, safety. Um, the, the women don't want to go in. And, you know, people see a homeless person with a dog and they say, come on. I mean, you know, it's a luxury to have a pet. Well, that might be the only thing literally keeping that person alive. And some reason to get out of their sleeping bag in the morning or, you know, that they like therapy dogs. Yeah. And you can imagine, like I said, the anxiety and, de and depression of, of that lifestyle. Um, so, you know, maybe, maybe there's one or two guys that decided to run away from home or, I mean, you know, that let, like it and find a, an element of freedom in it. But, uh, you know, for the vast majority, um, it's just a brutal lifestyle and one that's, like I said, it's been forced on them by lack of choices. Uh, I was wondering if you could tell us about, or, or read to us about, um, the last day of Margaret's life. Hmm. So it, like, like this, this poor woman, um, really in every chapter of her life, her, her childhood was so difficult because her parents were really demanding disciplinarians and, uh, and demanded this lifestyle of her. When she uh, went into the hospital, um, they, they left, they abandoned her within a couple of years. She was like 21. Uh, moved to the state so she had nobody to advocate for her and that was an absolute huge factor in just how poorly she was treated um, like I said the timing around being in in, in the hospital was the institution. so every chapter of her life including of course the last 10 years as a homeless person were just it's so difficult and yet she had this sweetness about her and this intelligence that I, I still could see that when we when we spoke and I and people loved her for it. I mean, they affectionately called her Princess Margaret. And uh, but, anyways, then the, the last chapter of her life, really, when she was, um, you know, in that sub shop and fell on the floor and hit her head and uh, and died alone. So yeah, I'll just I'll read from that chapter and call it the a lonely burial. On December thirteenth, under a cloudy, colorless sky, Margaret's body was driven across town by funeral coach to Woodland Cemetery a 100-acre tree-filled cemetery that overlooks the bay. The Truscott and Dwyer Funeral on King Street East, which has been in the same location since 1950, handled the city-funded burial. Because it was paid for by the city, there would be no mahogany casket, no visitation services where people could share their memories of Margaret, and no funeral service. Instead, her body was placed in a simple unfinished wood casket and quietly driven to the cemetery where no one was waiting. On the way to the cemetery, the coach likely passed by some of the coffee shops where Margaret had hung out and the alleyways where she'd slept. At Woodland, the co coach wound its way along the narrow asphalt lanes, past the trees and tidy rows of gray and black granite stones. Margaret's final home was section 10, row 39, grave eight. Cemetery staff dressed in blue coveralls had used special equipment to break through the frost and dig the hole. They unceremoniously lowered the box into the ground and tossed dirt on top. The year Margaret died, 3,872 people died in the city of Hamilton, most leaving this world to a ritual of grieving and tender words. Crowds would have gathered beside loved ones' grave sites and tears would have been shed in their memory. At Margaret's burial, no one was there to say goodbye. Police had failed to notify anyone of her death, so no one even knew that Hamilton's Princess of the Streets was gone. With no belongings to her name and no will to go over, it was as if she had never been born. Now, I have to tell you, after that, though, uh, I got a call a couple of days after that uh, from because they knew of my affection for Margaret and I've been writing stories on her. I got a call from someone saying she died. And then really, like, the city of Hamilton just exploded with... Uh, response, uh, the petitions for an inquest, uh, vigils, memorials. Um, um, an Oakville company offered to pay for her um, gravestone because they didn't want her to be forgotten in death as she was in life. Um, people really cared. There was really an outpouring of love. And I swear, every time I, I've given a talk in Hamilton, somebody will say, I knew her. Mm. I remember her at King and James. I used to make go out of my way to make sure I, I went down and gave her some money. And um, she was really a well-known figure, but uh, I don't think she knew that. I think that she, that, I don't think she felt very uh, remembered. Yeah, yeah um, Charles Crudhammer, who was a psychiatrist as well as an author, 
um, there's a really good quote from him, if, if you don't mind me reading it. Um, so Krauthammer said, um, 30 years ago, if you saw a person lying helpless in the street, you ran to help him. Now you step over him. You know that he is not an accident victim. He lives there. Mm -hmm. I was wondering um, if you could talk to us a little bit about what we can do on both a societal level mm -hmm. as well as a personal level um, to help all the other Margarets that are out there. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and I especially thinking of, you know, people don't necessarily know when, when they, you know, when they see someone on the street who might be panhandling or mm -hmm. uh, ask, you know, asking for change. Um, people don't know what they should and shouldn't do. They want to help, but they don't know what they should and shouldn't do. Mm -hmm. So like one side is the personal action, but the other side too has to be the societal action. What do we need? What needs to change in us as a society? All right. Yes. Yeah, and that, that's such a great quote. Uh, uh, he also wrote an a excellent column on, um, the, the, even though he's American, but he wrote a column on the Mental Health Act there too, because theirs is also this uh, danger to themselves thing. So that's a whole other, that's a whole other book. <laughs> but, um, but just to speak to his, his quote, and I do address this in, um, I, I wrote an article for the Toronto Star last week, and I just said, like, wh at what point did we lose our compassion? Like, what, at what point was it, you know, stop the car, get out, help that person on the street to blaming them, uh -huh. um, it, which is just this uh, very, like I said, so convenient to our politicians to let them off the hook like that, because um, this was not their fault. It's not their fault that they've landed there. I, I've compared it to cancer treatment. Uh -huh. I said, what if they decided, you know what, you, you probably caused that because you're smoking and you're eating wrong and your lifestyle and everything else. Like we're cutting half the cancer services. It, there is actually no difference except that's a physical illness. Um, so the end result would be people would die by much higher numbers than they are today. Um, and yet there's this whole thing because this is what one of the universal themes of this book is just the stigma around mental illness that we have. So, so yeah, what happened to our compassion? And, and please stop buying into the fact that uh, the, the myth that these people are, are there because they want to be and they're, they're, they're somehow enjoying themselves. But so how, how do you help? And I, I think that's an excellent question. And I, I reserved a whole chapter for it in my book because of that, because the issue of even do you give or not give to panhandlers, you know? And this, my friend, uh, Reverend Bill McKinnon, I thought had some excellent comments about that. Um, one was that, you know, first off, um, don't think that, you know, if you give them $5, don't think you can say, don't buy alcohol with it. Because he said, would you do that if to a, your friend? If you said, you know, here's a gift card for whatever, but don't spend it on alcohol. He's like, it's a gift. You're giving that as a gift to them. You have no right to tell them how to spend it. And if they feel like they need a, a, a bottle of beer, or whatever, then that's up to them. You know, you're, you're giving it to them as a gift and that's, that's up to them. So, and he also didn't like the idea of um, giving them a Subway sandwich or taking them to lunch. Because again, it's like if they were just treating them like your coworker or your friend, um, you know, would you just force a ham sub sandwich on them? But if they don't like it, they're allergic to it or, you know, again, get, leave that, that choice to them. So in terms of um, panhandlers, he's, he's, and also he said, it's a tough job. He said, you know, you, you hear about uh, people just like sitting there all day. No, it's, it's degrading. It's cold. It's, it's uh, uncomfortable. And he said like, worst of all, you know, you're victim to all these like, the stares and uh, uh, negativity around you. So I don't think it's easy. He said, you know, you hear about people like following van handlers home at the end of the day, and they've got like a, a little townhouse or something. And he's like, if, maybe they're living in subsidized housing and they literally have like $10 left at the end of the month. Like, don't, don't judge people's circumstances, that sort of thing. But so how to help you said from a societal and a personal. So there's so many things you could do um, on a personal basis. Um, yeah, they need uh, donations, um, you know, clothing. Um, they definitely need cash donations. Um, I started a project four years ago called Purses for Margaret. And um, it's when I found, you know, I was writing about Margaret's uh, uh, problem with uh, periods and everything else. And then found out that this is a huge issue among homeless women, because how do you go out buy Tampax when you're also starving to death? You know, just it's $5 here, $5 there. 
Um, so they do makeshift things and it's just so unsanitary and unhygienic. So, um, so the purses that I have donated and uh, they're just gently used purses um, and filled with toiletries, so shampoo and toothpaste and toothbrush and lotions. And in the winter time, I'll put mitts and socks and maybe those plastic ponchos and, and that sort of thing. It's been a huge response from the public. Uh, within six months, I think about 2000 purses were donated to Mary's place. And now, like, I will sometimes open my front door and there'll just be a boxes of purses there. I just have regular customers who right. are, are donating. It's just lovely. It's absolutely amazing because um, the staff at Mary's Place have told me that people, the women, are, are thrilled to get these purses uh, for what's in them. But uh, I think I said this in the book is that they also love the fact that somebody cared about them enough to do it. So they don't feel so forgotten because every day of their life, they feel forgotten. So, but in addition to that, and not to say you shouldn't do those, they really are band-aid solutions that help the person through one more night. And that is still needed. Those are emergency services that we still need. Uh, people are still, like the agencies are, are seriously underfunded. Uh, so they need as much help as they can get. But uh, on, a, on a larger issue, uh, and uh, Catherine Kalinowski from Good Shepherd spoke to this, and she's been in the industry for over 30 years. She said, you know, we definitely need those donations and um, uh, the help in the in the short term. But the, but the better thing is to have a permanent uh, long term solution, which is housing. And uh, that's where she said, you know, to get political. I mean, contact your MP, MPP, city councilor, school trustee, anybody you can uh, join a group, form a group. Uh, letter writing, um, emails, all that sort of thing, and just let them know you care. Because, you know, let's face it, on, on a very, uh, you know, um, honest basis, it's, the homeless people don't vote. Mm -hmm. And so if they're, you know, is the city councillor who's getting complaints from all his residents about tent encampments is going to try to appease the people who are complaining as opposed to kick the uh, homeless people because he needs, he wants the votes next election. So you have to let them know that, that, that uh, and then Catherine suggested when you do write to your MP, MPP, um, tell them a personal story. Tell them about walking downtown Coburg or uh, Hamilton and saying, you know, there's a certain corner where there's like 10 people who hang out or I've been trying to help this one woman by doing this or that. And uh, so definitely, um, you know, try to get uh, the word out to your, to your local politicians because this whole thing exists because of lack of political will. It's for now, no other reason. Now, the, you have, you've had also talked about the fact that there are cities and, and counties mm -hmm. and municipalities and countries yeah. that have essentially solved the yeah. issue of homelessness. Could you talk a little bit about that, please? Yeah, and that's, uh, that's like myth number three. Um, and it actually goes hand in hand really with myth number one about that this is a choice um, because you can't do anything about it. You can't get them off the streets anyways. So yeah, back in 2008, Medicine Hat, Alberta, um, and by the way, the mayor's name is Ted Clugston, and I watched a webinar on him in June, I think it was, and he started out by saying, I, the first thing you should know is that Medicine Hat is probably the most conservative city in the entire country. <laughs> that was his opening comment, and he said, so if we can do it, anybody can do it. So he was presented with this amazing report by uh, some staff people um, who basically just said to him, listen, it's costing you 100000 a year to keep people on the streets and to house them in subsidized housing with supports would be somewhere around twenty four, twenty five thousand. So he just did it like as a, a financial reasons. He just said like it wasn't he, he admits it. He said, I, I was pretty cold hearted because when they first said, like, let's solve homelessness, he joked, well, OK, let's solve world peace while we're at it. And he's like, you can't do it. Um, but when he saw this report, realize you could save all this money he's like we have to at least try so um the, one of the main ways that they've done it is to catch people within days of coming into a shelter because the longer they're on the streets like margaret the harder it is to reach um and you know that's the same with illnesses a, a mental illness um for someone who's who's housed and also physical illnesses like cancer or anything the longer they go untreated the more difficult it is to solve. So um, in Medicine Hat, their plan was get them within three days. And, um, and they took stock of their housing. I mean, it was a long 
long list of uh, the way that they did it. Um, and they now have bragging rights. So, so before the pandemic, they were actually doing talks across Canada, like being able to boast about the fact that they made this happen. Um, and it's all the, the just housing first program, which is that you house people, but you also provide individual supports, whether that's budgeting, childcare, uh, counseling for things, addiction supports, that sort of thing. Um, the one area that where they actually surprise them the most that they're making money on is uh, people are paying their tickets. So if they had a, a court ticket for jaywalking or disturbing the peace or whatever it was, people are actually making it to court because they have stable lifestyles. Mm -hmm. So, it, you know, it, it's an ongoing thing. So in, in Finland, I was just listening to a yeah. podcast the other day. They, when they started out, and I wrote it down here, they had about 20,000 homeless people in Finland, and now they've got 4,000. So they are still working mm -hmm. on, on ending it. Um, and their goal is by 2030 to completely eliminate it. And they're on track to do it. It's, it's actually not uh, rocket science. It's mm -hmm. really uh, all it takes is the political will to just say, this is what we're focusing on. We're going to do it. And, um, and we've got other countries that are, are provided templates for how to get there. Um, I just want to pause here for a moment, but, you know, I think on the back of the book, and I mean, this is in the slideshow too, but on the back of the book, there's this beautiful picture of I Margaret as a young I love woman. it. Yeah. And it is, as you mean, yeah. you know, and yet, you know, this Margaret and this Margaret are the same person. Yeah, yeah. You know, know, and um, and they are you know, they are our neighbors. Yes, yeah, I know. Um, I, I, their her brother, by the way, uh, in China, put me in touch with the two nephews in the states, and uh, I have just this whole uh, photo album yeah. full of pictures of her as a as a little girl and baby, and uh, yeah, when I came across the one on the the back. Mm -hmm. um, this is Bob Dixon's notes. I think that was in the book. Uh, when I came across the one uh, of her in that dress, these these are her the letters from family. Um, I don't know if I have that one here of the one in her um, in her in that Sunday. This was this was another one that was uh, of her in that dress with her two brothers. But um, yeah, when I came across that one, I just and, and then also her her diary because. Uh, when I saw her, her beautiful handwriting and um, I just, even to, uh, like I said to people, there were pages in the book that I had tears streaming down my eyes mm -hmm. as I was writing them and, and writing this part and knowing that this, this was, you know, that she had written in this diary. I was just uh, really impacted by that because uh, it just brought you so much closer to the life that she led and who she was and, and who she could have been. Like I said, so many times she's um she had dreams as a child like we all do being a teacher and uh she had certainly the potential to get there and actually she uh, would have been alive today she would have been uh 76 i guess if she'd lived so you know that's uh, she would have been okay it's like uh, that's why i put uh, casper's story in the book by the way to show that if you're in the right home yeah residential care facility and he was in one that he loved uh he lived there for 22 years you know and uh so it's not it's not a problem without a solution um as we're coming close to the end of our time together this afternoon um i wonder if you could could answer the question you know what do you feel is margaret's legacy mm, yeah Right. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, I, when I was talking to Steve Pake and he said, did, did her life matter? And I saw, I was like, I was like, I don't know where to start with that because it certainly did. Uh, she became, um, it, to me, uh, the symbol of how deinstitutionalization went wrong. I mean, I've never read any reports, books, studies, anything on what happened to people during deinstitutionalization. It was just sort of they closed the beds and nobody's really thought about it. Like even this, the social workers who, who uh, worked there when she was there said, um, you know, when people left, they were largely forgotten. We might get a call that they found somebody in her cemetery or something and they'd say, well, you know, we'll see what we can do. Um, but so the lack of follow up of, you know, when they when they left the hospital is was just unbelievable. So 
her gift really to me was showing me, giving me this, this really close up look at exactly day to day, sometimes hour to hour, what happened to her life inside that hospital. And like I said, I've, it's never been, it's never been revealed before. It's uh, so her files showed that to me. Um, and then of course her life afterwards on the street showed just the, the, the lives that so many people were living back then in the 90s when I met her and today mm -hmm. um, it perhaps could even say it's worse today because there's such a like a blame blame game going on and also these tent encampments are just so horrible and they and the number of homeless have grown so yeah her legacy was to show us close up exactly what people go through and what it's like and how and how they got there and I boy I, I I think her life matters. Well, thank you for writing about her. Um, through through your words, we have her words, and we get to know her, and um, and and yeah, her life really did matter. And you've made that you've made her real to all of us. So thank you. Thank you, Penny. That was great. Denise and Penny, thank you so much for your time today, and for telling us about the life of Margaret Jacobson. So much to take away from this interview. Um, so I'm just going to say a quick thank you to our audience for joining us today. We hope to see you next time. Just a reminder that um, the book, Her Name Was Margaret, is available for loan at the Coburg Public Library. You can also purchase a copy at local bookstores, Indico, and Amazon. Uh, many thanks to Furby House Books in Port Hope, whose ongoing partnership allows us to bring authors to the screen. Copies of the book can be purchased at Furby House in Port Hope as well. Um, so thank you, everyone, and take care. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much. Good night.